Last month, the nearest star to the Earth was in California. In a laboratory for the first time, the world's largest lasers forced atoms of hydrogen to fuse together in the same kind of energy-producing reaction that fires the sun. It lasted less than a billionth of a second, but after six decades of toil and failure, the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory proved it could be done. If fusion becomes commercial power one day, it would be endless and carbon-free. In other words, it would change human destiny. As you'll see, there's far to go, but after December's breakthrough, we were invited to tour the lab and meet the team that brought star power down to Earth. Uncontrolled fusion is easy. Mastered so long ago, the films are in black and white. Fusion is what a hydrogen bomb does, releasing energy by forcing atoms of hydrogen to fuse together. What's been impossible is harnessing the fires of Armageddon into something useful. The U.S. Department of Energy's Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory helps maintain nuclear weapons and experiments with high-energy physics. An hour east of San Francisco, we met Livermore's director, Kim Budell, in the lab that made history, the National Ignition Facility. The National Ignition Facility is the world's largest, most energetic laser. It was built starting in the 1990s to create conditions in the laboratory that had previously only been accessible in the most extreme objects in the universe, like the center of giant planets or the sun, or in operating nuclear weapons. And the goal was to really be able to study that kind of very high energy, high density condition in a lot of detail. The National Ignition Facility, or NIF, was built for three and a half billion dollars to ignite self-sustaining fusion. They tried nearly 200 times over 13 years, but like a car with a weak battery, the atomic engine would never turn over. NIF drew some nicknames. It did. Uh, for many years, the not ignition facility, the never ignition facility, uh, more recently than nearly ignition facility. So uh, this recent event has really put the ignition in the NIF. Ignition means igniting a fusion reaction that puts out more energy than the lasers put in. So if you can get it hot enough, dense enough, fast enough, and hold it together long enough, the fusion reactions start to self-sustain. And that's really what happened here on December 5th. Main laser operation will begin in approximately one minute. Last month, the laser shot fired from this control room put two units of energy into the experiment, atoms began fusing, and about three units of energy came out. Tammy Ma, who leads the lab's laser fusion research initiatives, got the call while waiting for a plane. And I burst into tears. It was just tears of joy. And I actually physically started shaking and, and jumping up and down. In, in, you know, at the gate before everybody boards. So everybody was like, what is that crazy woman doing? Tammy Ma is crazy about engineering. Um, and that's another one of our sensors. for. She showed us why the problem of fusion would bring anyone to tears. First, there's the energy required, which is delivered by lasers in these tubes that are longer than a football field. And how many are there altogether? 192 total lasers. Each one of these lasers is one of the most energetic in the world, and you have 192 of them. That's pretty cool, right? Well, pretty hot, actually. Millions of degrees, which is why they use keys to lock up the lasers. Shot director, ready. The beams strike with a power 1,000 times greater than the entire national power grid. Your lights don't go out at home when they take a shot because these capacitors store the electricity. In the tubes, the laser beams amplify by racing back and forth, and the flash is a fraction of a second. We have to get to these incredible conditions, hotter, denser than the center of the sun, and so we need all of that laser energy to get to these very high energy densities. All that wallop 
vaporizes a target nearly too small to see. Can I hold this thing? Absolutely. So let's let it go, and there we go. Unbelievable. Absolutely amazing. Michael Staterman's team builds the hollow target shells that are loaded with hydrogen at 430 degrees below zero. The precision that we need for making these shells is extreme. The shells are almost perfectly round. Uh, they have a roughness that is 100 times better than a mirror. You think about that, uh... If it wasn't smoother than a mirror, imperfections would make the implosion of atoms uneven, causing a fusion fizzle. So these need to be as close to perfect as humanly possible. That's right. That's right. And we do think there are among the most perfect items that we have on Earth. Staterman's lab pursues perfection by vaporizing carbon and forming the shell out of diamond. They build 1,500 a year to make 150 nearly perfect. All the components are brought together under the microscope itself, and then the assembler uses electromechanical stages to put the parts where they're supposed to go, uh, move them together, and then we apply glue using a hair. A hair? Yeah, usually something like an eyelash or a similar, or a cat whisker. You apply glue with a cat whisker? This way. Why does it have to be so small? The laser gives us only a finite amount of energy, and um, to drive a bigger capsule, we would need more energy. So it's a constraint of the facility that you've seen that is very large. And despite its big size, this is about what we can drive with it. The target could be larger, but then the laser would have to be larger. That is correct. Well. On December 5th, they used a thicker target so it would hold its shape longer and they figured out how to boost the power of the laser shot without damaging the lasers. So this is an example of a target before the shot. So Tammy Ma showed us an intact target assembly. That diamond shell you saw is inside that silver-colored cylinder. This assembly goes into a blue vacuum chamber three stories tall. It's hard to see here because it's bristling with lasers and instruments. This instrument they call Dante because they told us it measures the fires of hell. One physicist said, you should see the target we blasted December 5th, which made us ask, could we? Have you seen this before? This is the first time I'm seeing it. For Tammy Ma and for the world, this is the first look at what's left of the target assembly that changed history. An artifact like Bell's first phone or Edison's light bulb. This thing is gonna end up in the Smithsonian. The target cylinder was blasted to oblivion. The copper support that held it was peeled backward. The explosion on the end of this was hotter than the sun. It was hotter than the center of the sun. We were able to achieve temperatures that were the hottest in the entire solar system. Which would make an astronomical change in electric power. Unlike today's nuclear plants, which split atoms apart, fusing them is many times more powerful with little long-term radiation. And it's easy to turn off, so no meltdowns. But getting from the first ignition to a power plant will be hard. How many shots do you take in a day? We take, on average, uh, a little more than one shot per day. If this was theoretically a commercial power plant, how many shots a day would be required? Approximately 10 shots per second would be required. And the other big challenge, of course, is not just increasing the repetition rate, but also getting the gain out of the targets to go up to about a factor of 100. Not only would the reactions have to produce 100 times more energy, but a power plant would need 900,000 perfect diamond shells a day. Also, the lasers would have to be much more efficient Remember December's breakthrough put two units of energy in and got three out? Well, it took 300 units of power to fire the lasers. By that standard, it was 300 in, 
three out. That detail was not front and center at the Department of Energy's December news conference, which fused the advance with an unlikely timeline. Today's announcement is a huge step forward uh, to the president's goal of achieve, achieving commercial fusion within a decade. When you heard that President Biden's goal was commercial fusion power in a decade, you thought what? I thought it was nonsense. Charles Seif is a trained mathematician, science author, and professor at New York University who wrote a 2008 book on the hyping of fusion power. I don't want to diminish the fact that this is a real achievement. Um, ignition is a milestone that people have been trying for, to do for years. I'm afraid that there are so many technical hurdles, even after this great achievement, uh, that 10 years is a pipe dream. Those hurdles, Seif says, include scaling up Livermore's achievement. The December shot generated about enough excess power to boil two pots of coffee. The hurdles might be overcome, Seif says, but not soon. I have a running bet going that uh, we're not going to have it by 2050. Still, betting against Charles Seif's prophecy are more than 30 private companies designing various approaches to fusion power, including using magnets, not lasers. Three billion dollars in private money flowed into those companies in the last 13 months, including bets by Bill Gates and Google. Amid all this speculation, Lawrence Livermore's director, Kim Budell, is certain of one thing. Can you do it again? Absolutely. They're going to try again next month. Budell agrees the obstacles are enormous, but she told us commercial fusion power could be demonstrated in 20 years or so with enough funding and dedication. We likened the first ignition to the first Wright Brothers flight, which covered only 120 feet. It's one thing to believe uh, that the science is possible, uh, that the conditions can be created. Uh, it's another to see it in action. And it really is a remarkable feeling after working for 60 years to get to this point, um, to have first taken that first flight. It was 44 years from a puddle jump to supersonic flight. Whether fusion power is 10 or 50 years away, is now mainly an engineering problem. Lawrence Livermore has proven that from a machine, a star is born. The transition from fossil fuels to sustainable electric power has gone mainstream, most visibly in the auto industry. The major car companies are chasing Tesla with ambitious plans for fleets of electric vehicles. Those cars and trucks run on lithium batteries. The U.S. has massive quantities of lithium, but has been slow to invest in the mining and extraction of the metal. That's about to change. Lithium operations powered by clean energy are being developed in a long-neglected, impoverished part of California by the Salton Sea, not far from the Mexican border. The region is being called Lithium Valley, and just like the 1849 gold rush, companies are racing to strike it rich. East of San Diego and south of Palm Springs lies the Salton Sea, California's largest inland body of water. Spreading east from the sea is a giant, underground, mineral-rich geothermal field boiling with potassium, sodium, and lithium. It is a world-class lithium resource. This is. When you hear estimates of how big this resource could be, it's usually measured on annual tons produced. And we're confident that this is a, in excess of 300,000 tons a year. Right now, that's way more than half of the world supply of lithium. Eric Spomer is CEO of Energy Source Minerals, a company based by the Salton Sea in California's Imperial Valley. It's steaming ahead with plans to recover lithium using an existing electric plant powered by the vast underground geothermal field. 
We're moving into an era of green technology, especially with our cars. Where does this fit in? Our more conservative projection would support seven and a half million electric vehicles a year, which is half of the total U.S. car sales, or cars and trucks. Coming from the Salton Sea area? Correct. What about this plant? This plant will be 20,000 tons per year, which is equivalent to about 500,000 vehicles per year. Once up and running, the tons of lithium generated here will be shipped, refined, and processed into millions of rechargeable electric car batteries. Over 50% of our lineup and our retail sales will be from battery electric vehicles by the end of the decade. Mark Stewart is head of Stellantis North America, a global car maker that owns some of America's best known brands, including Chrysler, Jeep, and Ram trucks. It really is, quote unquote, the industrial revolution, the next phase, right? This is the most interesting and exciting time to be a part of our industry. Stellantis is investing $35 billion in an ambitious historic transformation. We're reimagining our factories on our assembly plants. They're already rolling our plug-in hybrids, uh, as well as looking to two new uh, battery joint ventures uh, that are in co full construction right now. The new industrial revolution? It absolutely is. It's really the, the biggest technological changes in our industry in nearly 100 years. We were down in the Salton Sea region. They believe they can supply the lithium needs for all American car manufacturers. Absolutely. That is the case. Whatever they can produce, you guys will be buying it. We for sure will take as much as we can get and as much as we have, we have already secured early. Lithium is key to powering electric cars. The dense metal helps make batteries rechargeable. There's a lot of it around, but extracting lithium is dirty business. Most comes from rock mines in Australia, or as powder evaporated from mineral ponds in South America. The U.S. has one lithium evaporation plant in Nevada. Energy Source plans to break ground on a clean billion-dollar facility here by the Salton Sea in the next few months. So the plant will fit in this spot right here? Correct, that that's spot not right a big, there. That's not a big footprint. No. What are these? We call them the mud pots. And they are CO2 vents, hot CO2 with fluid that's bubbling to the surface. So this is evidence of the heat and activity going on underground? Correct. The 600-degree geothermal brine that powers the region's electric plants comes from more than a mile beneath the earth. The boiling brine produces clean steam, which drives turbines to generate enough electricity to power 400,000 homes. In the past, the mineral-rich brine was simply returned to the earth. Now, Energy Source plans to extend the process and extract lithium from the brine before re-injecting it underground. Our process in combination with this resource will be the cleanest, most efficient lithium process in the world. And how long before the lithium processed here will be in commercial use in the U.S.? In 2025. A lot of the components that go into the batteries have been coming from um, you know, anywhere around the world but America. Why was that? We have a lot of um, decent resources in North America. They've just been undeveloped. David Deke worked for Tesla, traveling the world to find the best sources of lithium as it was building up production of its electric vehicles, or EVs. Tesla turned to the lithium-ion battery to power its cars, the same kind of rechargeable battery Sony first mass-produced for its camcorders. There was a new market for consumer electronics, but the vast majority is for electric vehicles. And that was pretty much triggered by Tesla? Triggered by Tesla. Also, you know, there's a lot of EV growth uh, and EV demand and production in, in China. That's been a big part, of, uh, big part of the global lithium demand story. Come on in. Deke is now Energy Source's chief development officer and says he had a eureka moment when he saw its unique technology. At the company's lab, Deke showed us the mechanics in miniature. The full-size plant will be 100 times larger. So what 
goes on inside this cylinder? Is it pellets or what, what is the, the huh. matrix? Yeah, I think of it as beads in a, in a column, much like the activated carbon that you would find in a Brita filter. It works in a, in a similar concept. A Brita filter will filter all impurities out of water. Mm -hmm. This sorbent is something that would only take in lithium and not absorb everything else. The system takes just a few hours to turn this orange brine into this clear lithium solution, which will be dried into powder. And this is what everybody's looking for. That's what everyone wants. Here by the Salton Sea, Energy Source is leading the race for lithium. Warren Buffett's BHE Renewables runs 10 geothermal power plants in the region. And there's another on the drawing board by an Australian company, Controlled Thermal Resources. Both ventures are moving to tap the promise bubbling under the earth. CEO Rod Colwell told us Controlled Thermal Resources had been fine-tuning the process at this test facility for 90 days. We're producing lithium from live brine here behind us. This is our optimization plant. Based on what it learns here, Controlled Thermal Resources plans to build a new plant for recovering lithium, which costs about $4,000 a ton to extract and currently is selling for six times more. The noise is from the machines cooling 600-degree brine, rising from the well, releasing steam. And this is a battery-grade product from Salt and Sea Brine. This yes. for you is Eureka. This is absolutely Eureka, yes. Rod Colwell told us this bottle of clear lithium chloride is the purest product from this test facility so far. This is the first time this has been in my hands. This happened last night, Bill said. I might take that home with me. That's about $10 worth of lithium right there, so... You know it works. We know it works. The question here in the Salton Sea Basin is, will it work for everyone? This rich lithium resource lies beneath one of the poorest sections of California. The Salton Sea was created when the Colorado River flooded the basin in 1905. But for the past 50 years, the main source of water has been chemical-laden agricultural runoff. And for decades now, the sea has been evaporating and shrinking. A once thriving tourist industry has been replaced by environmental decay, toxic dust, and economic hardship. And with unemployment in the region hovering around 16%, there's a lot riding on turning the Imperial Valley into Lithium Valley. Governor Newsom called it, you know, the Saudi Arabia of lithium. I think, you know, it can change the landscape of the region. Frank Ruiz, the Audubon Society's local program director, is fighting to include the community in that change. He was a commissioner on the state panel studying how the entire region can benefit from the potential underground. You're an environmentalist. How do you reconcile the industrialization of this area with saving the wildlife and the communities? We need to learn how to balance the tables. The lithium industry can be really good, you know, for these communities. It can, you know, it can provide better paid jobs. It can provide more job opportunities, especially for the younger folks. It can provide the revenues, you know, to offset the challenges that we have here at the Salton Sea. Geologists predict once the industry is fully operational, the lithium underground should last for generations before running out. Good news for Stellantis, which ran out of batteries for its plug-in hybrid Jeep Wrangler last year. We sold out. What happened? The, you know, if, uh, if I could turn back my crystal ball, Bill, I would have uh, secured a little more capacity for, uh, for last year. To prevent that from happening in the future, Mark Stewart and Stellantis have committed to buying lithium from controlled thermal resources at the Salton Sea, knowing it will be years before its product is commercially viable. We secured a large supply from them over a 10-year period uh, because we are very positive on their technology. So is car maker General Motors, which has invested in controlled thermal resources. The Department of Energy and U.S. automakers are eager for domestic lithium. The companies were stung when the pandemic disrupted the worldwide supply chain, stalling shipments of microchips, parts, and batteries. 
Still today, three quarters of all lithium batteries are processed in Asia. Current lithium, what typically happens, right, it's mined in one spot, it's moved across the world for processing and comes back. Think of all that additional cost, think of all that additional carbon that's being used to do that, and at the end, someone pays for it, and that's a consumer. So will having this domestic supply of lithium help keep the cost of electric vehicles down? It will certainly help. Prices for electric cars are coming down and are projected to be on par with gas vehicles within a few years, driven in part by the tax incentives in the 2022 Inflation Reduction Act. Eric Spomer of Energy Source told us the tax benefits have also been a catalyst for developing domestic lithium. We're starting to see big announcements of investments to create that domestic demand so it doesn't ever have to go across an ocean. This seems like this is a game changer for American industry. It's a competitive advantage. It's an opportunity that we can be a leader globally, and why not lead? Last month, the world's top climate scientists delivered a sobering warning. Their mammoth report to the UN boiled down to one message, act now before the climate breakdown becomes unstoppable. The report says extreme weather has forced millions of people from their homes and devastated food supplies. Oil and gas emissions are at a record high. The UN report calls for drastic cuts in fossil fuels. But if our old technologies got us into this mess, can new ones get us out? Among politicians, corporations, and billionaires, one new technology is gaining traction. It's called direct air capture that vacuums carbon dioxide out of thin air and locks it away underground. Sound like science fiction? We thought so too, until we went to Iceland to see the world's first commercial direct air capture plant in operation. Here, on a frigid plain near the Arctic Circle, worries about an overheating planet seem far away. Yet tiny Iceland has put itself on the front line with a new kind of machine that will fight climate change by sucking carbon dioxide out of the air. This is Orca the first commercial direct air capture plant on Earth. What are these fans? How does this work? Here you see the backside of these collectors, where the air is being pulled through the system by aid of these fans. Carlos Hertel is chief technology officer for Climeworks, the Swiss company that built Orca. He told us as the fans draw air in, the carbon dioxide is trapped by a special filter inside these giant collectors, each the size of a shipping container. The captured CO2 is then siphoned off to storage tanks. We had to shout over the powerful fans as a bitter wind whipped around us. So you didn't come for this wonderful weather? No, we did not. <laughs> we knew that the windows were harsh, but it's a good real-life test as well for the plant. What you're describing almost sounds like science fiction, but what you're saying is that we can actually do this. People never doubted the fundamental physics or chemistry of it, but realizing it under real-life conditions is a whole different matter. And that's what this system shows. It can be done. Climeworks is now building a new plant in Iceland 10 times the size of Orca that will look like this, a modular design that Hertel told us can be easily assembled. But capturing the CO2 is only half of the story. So this is where the magic happens. The second half starts here in these metal igloos, where the CO2 is sent to be buried in the porous volcanic rock of Iceland. So this pipe is actually filled with water. Sandra Osk is a geologist with CarbFix, an Icelandic company that pioneered the groundbreaking injection method. Here we have the CO2, and the CO2 is actually dissolved in water, so it's actually just fizzy water. Just fizzy water? Yeah. And this fizzy water is being injected here into the injection well. This How far down does it go? It actually reaches over a mile down. A mile down? Yeah. 
The fizzy water is shot like a soda stream into Iceland's basaltic rock, where it reacts with the minerals and hardens to stone in less than two years. So the fizzy water turns into this mm, yes. so in this, just a matter of years. So you, so you take this gas that you can't see, you turn it into fizzy water, and then it turns to stone, and you don't have to worry about it. Turned into stone. It's, <laughs> it's quite amazing. Yeah. Carb fix didn't invent the process. Nature did. But nature takes millennia. After years of experimenting in Iceland's grueling outdoor laboratory, CarbFix figured out how to speed things up. Aerospace engineer Carlos Hertel told us Orca was a milestone. Now the hard part starts, scaling up fast enough to slow climate change. Whether we are taking the right direction will depend as much on societal things than on technical matters. Am I optimistic as an engineer? I am, absolutely. Am I optimistic as a citizen? Maybe half-half. I haven't made up my mind yet. This goal can be reached technically. It's just whether we have the political and social will to do it. I think that's the exact right way of looking at it. There's been a stampede of investment. Microsoft, Airbus, insurance giant Swiss Re have poured in millions of dollars, but it's a stupefying challenge. Orca is built to take out the emissions of about 800 cars, or 4,000 tons of CO2 a year, a tiny fraction of the annual 10 billion tons scientists say we need to remove from the atmosphere. It's the problem of our generation. It's like a moonshot. It's going Calorie Hegelson is an astrophysicist with CarbFix. He told us studying space helped him to think big. We met him on a barren stretch of rock that could have been Mars. But Hegelson told us he saw potential. We need big solutions. We need to return the carbon back to where it came from, which is the Earth. Tell me what you're doing here. This will be a first-of-a-kind carbon mineral storage terminal, which means that we are going to bring in CO2, transport it from industrial point sources in Europe, and ship it here and inject it for full mineral storage. It will be the world's first industrial-scale underground disposal site for CO2, capable of handling three million tons a year. Hagelson sketched out a new world where tankers running on green methanol would transport carbon dioxide from European businesses to Iceland. Is this going to happen fast enough to help us with climate change? I don't know, to be perfectly honest. Um, we are demonstrating the first mineral storage hub here at the megaton scale. Whether that will happen in time, that is not entirely up to us. That is up to politicians, governors, financiers, societies. And quite frankly, we are running out of time. Direct air capture as it now exists is expensive and energy intensive. In Iceland, that energy is geothermal renewable and green. That's not the case elsewhere. So governments in Europe and the U.S. have dangled billions of dollars of tax breaks to encourage companies to take the plunge. But there's a bigger question than just who writes the check. Do you fear that people will think, oh, well, we can now clean the air. We can just take the CO2 out of the air. So we can carry on with business as usual. All the time, yeah. But that's not how it works. We must stop the emissions and wean ourselves off of fossil fuels. That's what we need to do right now. On top of that, we also must take down the carbon that we've already put up in the atmosphere. Only then will we reach our climate goals. So carbon capture can never be an excuse for continuing business as usual. But it's that business as usual that critics are warning against as direct air capture expands to the U.S. That's because here, oil companies are one of the technology's biggest boosters. They have been capturing CO2 to inject into oil wells for decades, not to bury it, but to flush out more oil. For Cowrie Hagelson of CarbFix and many others, that's a non-starter. We don't see the need to work with the oil and gas sector. Well, if the oil and gas mm -hmm. industry 
could help with the financing of the direct air capture, why not team up with them? We don't need them for direct air capture. And quite frankly, we don't want there to be an oil and gas industry in 40, 50 years. There will still be an oil industry in 50 years. I have no doubt about that. I think our company, though, will be a different company by 2050. That company is Occidental Petroleum, and Vicki Holub is CEO. She wants to turn Oxy into what she calls a carbon management company. It has set aside more than a billion dollars to build what will be the world's largest direct air capture plant in Texas. So this would represent the CO2 that's equivalent to taking 200,000 cars off the road. Holub showed us the Texas version of how CO2 would be sucked out of the air. These are air contact towers. Some of the captured CO2 will be locked away underground, just as we saw in Iceland. Some will still be used to extract more oil. But Holub told us using carbon sucked out of the air means the new oil produced is what she calls carbon neutral. That was hard to wrap our heads around. But she'll be using carbon that you're capturing and taking out of the air to produce more oil that will then generate more carbon. But the, the oil will emit less carbon than the CO2 we've injected to get it. So we've put more, at least the equivalent, and sometimes more CO2 in the ground to get that oil than the oil will emit when used. Holub told us producing oil this way is essential in the transition to a green economy. Airlines and ships, for example, would need to run on fossil fuels until a sustainable alternative is found. That could take years. Until then, Holub argues, using CO2 to get that oil helps keep a lid on emissions. Your critics will say you can't trust an oil company talking about reducing CO2 that your mission here is tantamount to greenwashing. I would first say that we would never spend $1.2 billion for greenwashing. So we've got a monumental task ahead of us. The way that the CO2 enhanced oil recovery process works is that we can reduce more out of the atmosphere than what um, our products will emit when used. And so if that's not a concept that people can get, then we, we, will know, we will not have a chance to achieve what we need to achieve. Holub told us she knows critics of big oil are suspicious and that many feel industry isn't moving fast enough to avoid a climate catastrophe. On that point, Holub doesn't disagree. She told us, with the help of tax incentives, Occidental plans to build 130 more direct air capture plants by 2035. We know how to make it happen. We know how to drill the wells. We know how to safely sequester it. We were in Iceland and we were talking to some of the direct air capture companies. And to be blunt, they don't quite believe you. We're going to walk the talk. That's the only way that does it. Words will never convince anybody. We need to get the direct air capture up and working. We need to um, make it better, make it more economical, and start having it developed all around the world. The next decade will be critical if the direct air capture industry is to grow big enough to make an impact. Both CarbFix and Climeworks told us they will be expanding to the U.S. Neither plans to work with the American oil industry.